and welcome to Voices of the West from Dusty Saddle. Today, we have the honor of being able to interview the top selling author in Westerns in the United States today for not one, not two, but three books that we're running out here that are all in the top 10, two that have been at number one for the last several days. Uh, Dave Fisher, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So Dave, tell everyone a little bit about yourself and the magic that it takes to become the number one bestseller. Oh, there's not any magic. It's just a lot of long, hard work. Uh, I started writing probably in the early 90s. Uh, I got out of high school. I went to pretty much just mountain manning for a couple of years. And then I got involved in rodeo and I rodeoed South Bank Live for quite a few years. And then I decided I want you know, do more with horses than just, you know, an eight second bike. So I started getting, started to learn how to pack horses and pack up in the high country in Mexico, Alabama, anyway. And so I went to Alaska for the first time and, and I packed for an outfitter. And then I came back and I worked on a ranch in Wyoming. And then I went back to, uh, after Wyoming, I went to Montana and I packed up in the Bob Marshall and the uh, Scapegoat Wilderness. And then I went to, um, uh, so when I went to back to Alaska, packed for an outfitter back in the bush, and then the next year packed for another outfitter back in the bush. Uh, previous to that, I had also worked cattle in Oregon. Cattle ranch in Oregon. So that's where I'm originally from. So none of this is necessarily research. This is all you've lived all this and you felt it all. I have, yeah. What I put into my books is what it's really like. And so when I say that a horse feels a certain way, that's how it feels. If a horse bucks a certain way, that's how it bucks. Uh, I've shot all, just by all kinds of Western guns that you can shoot. So when I say this, that it shoots like this, that's how it shoots. And um, so where I got started writing was I was working for the cattle company in Oregon. And we were driving some uh, cattle out of the mountains because we were gonna move them to the other side of the state. <clears throat> And the, the boss said, I got this little three-year-old Daffy. I want you to start working him up in the mountains. We've been used to moving cattle. That's okay. I'm 20, 25 years old. No, I was 30 at the time. I was 30 at that time. And uh, I had just gotten married. We had just been married. And uh, so I was up there on the mountain, driving the cattle down. And if anybody knows anything about Appaloosa, which is uh, they're a little squirrely to begin with. Wonderful horses, but they're a little squirrely. And, uh, and anything under five years old is a little extra squirrely. So I got this three-year-old. We're working our way down a little trail. And he uh, decided he didn't want to play no more. So he started to buck on this little bitty trail with a 20-foot clip on the left side and uh, timber on the right side. And I'm like, this is not a good place to play this game. So I'm trying to get him under control. And he, so he decided to use little that lock trick and put himself to work back. So he flipped himself over backwards, but the problem was he went over the cliff and he did it. Oh. And he landed on me. And he landed on me. And so the only thing that really saved me from being completely crushed was we landed on some brush and they gave me like six, six inches of cushion. <laughs> so I'm laying in the right room. I got my right boot up on the top. So I just start digging my spur into the boot with my spur until he finds the hole. Maybe I should get up now. So he got up. I got up with him and we rode back out. And uh, I continued working for a few more days, cutting cattle, you know, 12 hours in saddle, cutting cattle. The third day when we got done, I couldn't get out of saddle. Something froze up in my back. And it was uh, about three years before I was walking decently. And so that kind of put an end to my cowboy career. I got involved with law enforcement after that. That's where I healed up and got involved with law enforcement. So that you'll see a lot of law stuff in my stories, too, in my cowboy career. But um, at that point, that kind of put it into my, my cowboy because I, I was a horseshoe and a horse breaker and that and at that point I couldn't I was a bend over. <clears throat> and so that kind of <clears throat> excuse me, that kind of put an end to my cowboy career. So I had to think, well, what do I want to do now? I got, I got all this knowledge, all this experience. What do I do with it? I, thought, I need to write. I need to write westerns. And so Louis Lamore was always a big, was a big guy for me. I was well like his book. So I kind of used him and his book as an idea of how to write a decent Western. And I started to write. 
Well, the first few years I wrote, it was like, mm, ah, this, this is hard to edit. And it, it took a while before I started getting aware of, it started to sound like a real story. So I put several years of working hard, writing hard, studying, researching. And eventually I started to put together uh, stories and books that uh, were starting to get people's interest to start to sell. And I did a lot of short story writing. Short story is great because it teaches you how to write tight, write a good story tight. So yeah. I do a lot. Definitely. So what was your inspiration for the entire series we're in the middle of here that's sitting up there at number one, starting with the uh, Kills Mini Quickly? Uh, I've always been interested in the Mountain Man era. And since I spent a lot of time living basically the modern day Mountain Man experience in, uh, in Alaska and also up in the, in the wilderness areas and that, plus I did a, you know, I did years of the beaver trapper and trapping. I understood all about that. I understood all about the, out, the Rocky Mountains. Spent a lot of time in Rocky Mountains. Another job I had was I was packing uh, for the National Park Service in Rocky Mountain National Park. So I was all over the Rocky. So the Rocky Mountain country I know very well. And so I just incorporated that in. But I wanted something that wasn't just your run of the mill Hollywood mountain man story like everybody else does. I wanted something that was more realistic that was more expressive of the actual people that lived at the time and the experiences that they had. So I wanted something that was different from, you know, the rope mountain man story. So I started putting together, okay, so what would these people actually do? How would they actually act? How would I act if I was in their place? And I just started to build on that. Very good. You know, I brought a lot of the history in, a lot of the places that are historical, so put a lot of history in. I always put a lot of history in all my stories. All of my books, I end with a historical note. So something that was mentioned in the story was, was, was a historical thing. So what I would do is at the end of the story, I would have the historical note that explains what that was. Mm -hmm. So how much research do you end up putting into these books as you write them? A lot. I do a lot of research. What I like to do is I'll dig up the old maps. And um, the internet is great for that because you can dig up old maps. And what I'll do is I'll dig up the old maps. What was the actual name of that trip at the time? What, was, what did people actually call that area at the time? What was that town called? Well, that town's not there anymore. So I, you know, I get, like you say, for instance, uh, uh, Mount Man series is in uh, 1832. So I found maps from the 1830s uh, that the explorers had drawn up of the West and all the other places. And I just incorporated the actual places from those maps into the story. Yeah, definitely gets you so historically accurate, definitely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I try to. You know, sometimes people say, well, that's not how it happened. But actually, that is how a lot happens. You were watching all the birthday cast down. You spent the time looking it up. I think I'll stick with your word on that, definitely. <laughs> so, what do you think makes a good Western story? Realism. I think that you you don't have to have lived the life of like it gives it if you have lived in that country, if you lived in the West, I've lived all through. Wyoming, Montana, Colorado, Oregon, uh, Nevada. I've spent a lot of time in all those places, studied a lot of the history, been to a lot of historical sites. I uh, lived in Reno for a while, and my daughter and I, our favorite thing to do is go up to Oklahoma City and just scan the, the areas and see what really happened up there, look the buildings over a little bit, just what the building like looks like. Go into the museum, check out the old, the old photographs and that. And so, that's what I like to do is go to museums, check out the photographs, check out the history, go to the actual site so that when you say the country looked like such and such, that is what the country looked like because I stood there and looked at it. And this, this is what you're seeing. Or like through the Rockies, what, what's, what are the Rocky Mountains like? Uh, so I've been there, I know what it's like. Like for instance, I'll write about a big storm coming up and the prairie and the Plains Country Rocky Mountains get full some tremendous storms that rain, hail, sleep, all of within 10 minutes you beat to your death. And I've been caught out in a lot of those to the point where they just stroke right through your sweater, right through your chaps, right through your boots, and you might as well just jump in. 
So when I was playing in the how the storms roll in with the black clouds and thunder and the lightning booming, it's like, yeah, I've been in a bunch of those. So it's really, and I think that what makes a good Western story is if you've been in the country and you can actually describe the feel, the smell, and that's what I like to do. I like to put all, all five senses into that story. Absolutely. You'd said earlier that you wanted to write a story that was different than the typical thing. What is what are some areas of the West that you don't think have been properly written about, explored, that type of thing yet? Um, I think a, a, the thing is a lot of it's been exaggerated with the lawman and law cars and that. That uh, I like to dig down through, you know, the nonsense. Okay, we're going to dig through this pile of nonsense. We're going to get down to what really happened. I like the diaries, uh, or say, for instance, uh, in um, in Fort Worth. I mentioned this in one of the uh, in the last season one writer book. Is uh, Hell's Half Acre? Uh, back it was close oh, 1870s or 1880s, just after 1880s that uh, Jim Corwright had to shoot at with Luke Ford. Well, Bat Masterson was there, and he and he wrote the actual events of what happened, which is totally different than what most historians would say. Well, this is what happened. This is what happened. And Bat Masterson, who was who became a sports writer after this, he wrote up this is what happened, and he wrote it kind of like the sports writer that he was. And so I like to find things like that. Like for instance, I've written about uh, the Sioux Wars, like with Fort Phil Kearney and that. And I have found the, the uh, telegram transcript between General Grant and uh, Colonel Killington and General Sherman, all going back and forth about what happened at Fort Kearney, what happened at the Sherman Massacre. And so there, so you find the, I like to find the authentic material and work out its story. Absolutely. Primary sources are always a beautiful thing. Yeah, so I think the biggest problem with a lot of Westerns is they don't use any historical material. And so a lot of the stuff they have about the alcohol and the and stuff, but that it, it's too Hollywood. That's not what really happened. These were just regular people. See, they didn't think they were making history. That's like Wyatt Earp said before he died. He says, God owes me an explanation of all the things that happened. <laughs> so, I mean, they're just people. And you got to write them like they were just people. Mm-hmm. They weren't perfect. They weren't great. You know, they were just people. They made mistakes. And okay. Generally, the same problems that we have. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Things have not changed. If you really look at what happened then, what happens now, things have not changed when it comes to human history. So, when you're writing your stories, what comes first for you, the plot or the characters? Uh, if it's if it's characters I've used already. Uh, I will continue those characters. If it's something brand new where it's all new characters, I will start with a main couple of characters. And the stories basically write themselves because I'll start out with an idea for the story and I'll start writing it. And it and basically I say, okay, what happened? What will they do next? What will they say next? So then I write that and pretty soon the story just uh, evolves and writes itself. And as I move along, I say, okay, I need another character here. I need another, I need a protagonist here. I need a buddy here. I need a good guy. Oh, I need a villain. I need a this. I need a villain. And so it just pretty much uh, creates itself as I go. And then once I've got, got the first rough written, then I go back in and start to, to do the uh, continuity edit and just kind of put it all together. Very good, yes. Um, as the number one writer in the U.S. and everything as of the last couple of weeks here, um, what advice can you give to writers who are trying to get out their first story and trying to head down the Western Trail and basically get started? Um, don't think the first thing you write is good. I run into that a lot. I've had a lot of new writers who go, you know, they want to show me what they've written or they want to ask me stuff, and they can't stand anyone saying this isn't good or this needs to be improved, they get upset. First thing is realize the fact that you need to learn. You need to learn. If you're going to write Western, 
either you need to spend some time in the West, because if you're living in New Jersey trying to write a Western, it's not going to fly. It'll be a spend some time in the West, get a feel for the country, get a feel for the people, because the people are completely different from the West. So you've got to get a feel for the people, a feel for the country, or look at the country, see what it really looks like, um, and then do a lot of research, get it accurate, and write and write and write until you get at it. And that's the first, that's what I always tell you that. Just keep writing until you're good at it. And never think you're good enough because if you think you're good enough, you're done. And I will never be good enough, but I'll always find ways to make it better. Absolutely. You keep at it and keep doing it all the time and don't ever stop, basically. <laughs> and and if you want to write Westerns, you need to know the West. You need to go mm -hmm. get to know the people that go to. Western people, ranchers and cowboys, are a whole different breed. They're totally different from anybody else. And they will tell you exactly what they think. There is no beating around the bush rock. They will tell you exactly what they think. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So where can readers discover more about you, besides the top 10 at the moment? <laughs> <laughs> um, I have uh, a bio on Amazon. I had I had a website for a while that was with um, GoDaddy, and GoDaddy changed everything and ruined my website, and so I just dropped the website. And then it gave me just some other thing that worked with that was absolutely horrendous. If I so I put all the information on Amazon, so they can go to this. And uh, I use my middle initial real thing to look for Dave P. Fisher, or it'll come up with. There's another Dave Fisher, Dave Fisher, who writes rabbit. And when I first started writing, and I just put Jay Fisher, everybody kept coming up with him. So I need to do something different. So I put the P, my middle initial, in it. So now it's Dave P. Fisher. Uh, and that way you'll come up. But uh, Amazon, I got a whole bio on there, all the different books I've got. I have, uh, I do a lot with my own uh, imprint because I was published by several different publishing companies who did absolutely nothing for me to take my money. Mm -hmm. Take by uh, their, their big percentage and give me the, the little percentage, which is nothing. So I got, so as each contract expired, I took my book back and I started my own imprint, uh, Double Diamond Novel and uh, Double Diamond Book Club. And I got 38 of those out there. Now I got the 10 of Jeffrey Saddle. And I've also, uh, I've written over 70 short stories that you can find in different short story collections. I got a couple of collections. Uh, I actually won nine Reader's Choice Awards for a short story. And uh, and I've also won three Little Rogers Golden Medallion Awards, too. So a little bright in this. <laughs> but um, if they go there, they can find all my books. Excellent. Well, Dave Fisher, thank you very much for joining us today. I appreciate all of your comments. And definitely congratulations on the, the multiple number ones in the last week. And you're definitely dominating the top 10 at the moment. Well, thank you. And I, 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 at the end, I want to thank you for the coverage that you made. And everybody else at Death to Salad that has done such a great job helping me with my book. So I want to thank everyone at Death to Saddles. And I want to thank all the readers who are reading. I want to make sure everyone, we, you got, you got to appreciate the people. We appreciate having you along with us.